Well, hello, everybody. Those of you who are watching on the Fredericksburg campus or from the North Central campus, from Fiesta Journey Fellowship, we issue you a special welcome as well. Let's all hold up our Bibles, say the prayer that we pray every time we open them to study in the book of Acts. You ready? Dear Lord, thank you for your wonderful acts. What you did then, would you do again? What you did through them, would you do through us? In Jesus' name, amen. Now open your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. The ninth chapter of Acts. And um, if you don't have a Bible with you, elbow somebody who does. They cannot look on with you. Um, we also have loaners. So you might remember on future occasions, we have loaner Bibles out in the foyer that you can pick up. And no, I did not steal those from hotels, as somebody <laughs> suggested. Though through the years, I probably could have collected a bunch. But I'm an honest guy. I'm an honest guy. We're going to read Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And we're going to read quite a while, so kind of settle in. We're going to go all the way down to verse 20. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and there you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, <clears throat> hearing a voice but seeing no one. And then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one calling for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I'm seeing Ananias hurry through the narrow Damascus streets. His dense and bristling beard does not hide his serious face. And friends call as he passes, but he does not pause. Saul, they call. Oh, sorry. Ananias, they call. Oh, I got ahead of the story, didn't I? Ananias, but he never stops. He's a man with a mission. He's headed somewhere. He wonders if he has misheard these instructions. For he murmurs as he walks. Saul, Saul, 
couldn't be true. He wonders if he should tell his wife where he is going. Wonders if he should tell some friends where he's going in case he never returns. But he doesn't tell anybody. He doesn't tell his wife. She'd call him crazy. He doesn't tell his friends. They'd say he was a fool. They would tell him not to go. But he has to go. He scampers through the courtyard of the chickens and the towering camels and the small donkeys. And he steps past the shop of the tailor. And he doesn't respond to the greeting of the tanner. He keeps moving until he reaches a street called Straight. It's a great name for a street. He reaches Straight Street. He has a friend named Judas who runs an inn on Straight Street. It has low arches and large rooms with mattresses. By Damascus standards, it's very nice. The stay of choice for anybody of significance and power. And Saul is certainly both. It doesn't surprise Ananias to know that Saul is in Damascus. They've been expecting him. Some of the Christians have gone into hiding knowing he was coming. Others have left town. Saul's reputation as a Christian killer preceded him. But Saul's reputation as a Christ follower. This was the message of the vision that Ananias had. And he rehearses it in his mind as he walks to see if he misheard. Arise and go to the street called Straight. And inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he had seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Ananias nearly choked on his matzo as he heard that. This couldn't be true. He argued with God. He reminded God of Saul's track record as a terrorist. He said, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. I've heard it from many people. Saul is a topic of heated conversation around our table. At the leadership meetings. When the congregation is together. Someone always says, have you heard about Saul? Let me tell you what Saul did to my relative. Saul is bloodthirsty. Why somebody painted a poster of Saul put his face on the wall of the church foyer and put a big mustache across it. And beneath it, Saul, the Christian slayer. The church was afraid of Saul. Everybody saw Saul as the equivalent of a first century Darth Vader. He brought nothing but shadow and bad news. And yet God gave this vision to Ananias to see Saul in a different light. Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Verse 15. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The name Saul and chosen vessel just don't seem to go in the same sentence for Ananias. Saul the heavy, Saul the hit man, yeah, but not Saul, the chosen vessel. Ananias shakes his head at the thought. By now, he's halfway down Straight Street, and he's seriously considering turning around. And he would have, except the two guards spot him. What brings you here? They shout from the second story of the inn. They stand at attention, and their faces are stern and wintry with unrest. Ananias knows who they are. They're soldiers from the temple. They are Guards who travel with Saul. He gulps and he gives them an honest explanation. I've been sent to help the rabbi. They lower their spears. We hope you can, they say. Because we've tried everything else. Magicians, sorcerers, physicians. Well, Ananias can't turn back now. And the guards invite him to ascend the stairs, and he does. And they step aside and invite Ananias to step into the room. And when he does, 
He gasps at what he sees. A gaunt man sitting cross-legged on the floor, half shadowed by a shaft of sunlight. He's hollow-cheeked and he's dry-lipped, and he murmurs a prayer as he rocks back and forth. Ananias turns to the soldiers and says, How long has he been like this? Three days, they say. Saul's head sits large on his shoulders. He has a beak nose and a bushy ridge for eyebrows. And the food on the platter and the water in the cup sit on the floor untouched. His eyes stare in the direction of an open window, but he can tell that Saul sees nothing. A crusty film covers his eyes, and Saul doesn't even bother to brush away the flies. Ananias hesitates as he steps into the room. If this is a setup, he thinks, I'm history. But if it's not, the moment is history. I think this particular moment deserves a little more press than we tend to give it. I think it deserves a drum roll. It deserves its own drama, its own stained glass reenact church of God beyond measure. And look at this. He tried to, what? Destroy us. Ananias knew what harm Saul had done to the Jerusalem church. But what Ananias did not know is what Jesus had done to Saul on the road to Damascus. Now this trip to Damascus for Saul was Saul's idea. Word reached the Jerusalem leaders that the church was really growing in Damascus. And so Saul volunteered. He said, turn me loose on those folks and I'll take care of them. And he saddled his horse and he rode that 150-mile journey between Jerusalem and Damascus. He avoided all of the Gentile cities. This was a holy journey. It was a jihad of sorts. You might call it his first missionary journey. It was a hot journey. The section between Mount Hermon and Damascus is infamous for being an oven on earth. The heat can strike you like a spear. And it was somewhere on this thirsty section of the Jerusalem to Damascus journey that Saul was struck to the ground by the appearance of the resurrected Jesus, which is a fascinating thought. The Jesus who even at this moment indwells a resurrected body in the heavenly kingdom, descended to earth yet again and appeared in front of of Saul was such a bright light that Saul fell off of his horse. And Jesus asked him a question. Well, what was the question? Saul, Saul, called out his name twice. There were times that my mother would call out my name twice. And it seemed to be when she was bewildered by my behavior, Max, Max, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Just for the record, I'll say I would not have been that gentle with Saul. I don't think I would have been asking him questions. I think I would have been making some proclamations, like off with your head. But Jesus, who is ever gentle, even with the hard-hearted, Ask Saul a question. And Saul, who's on his knees in the sand and his face in the dirt, raises his head and he looks and he jams his fists into his eyes. It's like sand is in his eyes. And when he opens them, he cannot see. The living center of his eyes is gone. He has the vacant stare of a Roman statue. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The guards escort Saul 
as per the instructions of Jesus to Damascus. And they take him to the room. And there he sits for three days, three nights, in utter darkness, alone with his thoughts, alone with God. And that's where Ananias finds him, on the street called Straight. And Ananias steps into the room, and he sits on the stone floor next to Saul and takes the hand of the had-been terrorist. It's trembling. He notices that there's a spear and a sword leaning against the corner. And the lips of Saul begin to quiver. And you know what Ananias says to him? He says, Brother Saul, how sweet those words must have sounded to Saul. Brother Saul. The Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me that you may receive your sight and receive the Holy Spirit. And I would imagine that Saul at this point releases a torrent of tears that wash away those scales and all that's left is for Saul to wipe them away and he turns and he looks and he sees his new friend Ananias within an hour Saul will be stepping out of a baptistry within short order Saul will be preaching his first sermon soon thereafter Saul will be known as Paul and Paul will preach from Mars Hill, from the hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus, the streets of Rome and Corinth. He will preach sermons that we still read, and he will write letters that we still study. He will inspire and sire a whole genealogy of theologians, the best thinkers the world has ever seen, men like Calvin and Luther and Swingley and Augustine. God used Paul to touch the world. But he used Ananias to touch Paul. And I'm wondering if that's where you and I come in. I'm wondering if God has placed a Saul in your life. And that you and I have the opportunity to touch somebody who will touch the world. Now, there's a thought. Who is a Saul? A Saul is a person that everyone else has given up on, that everyone else avoids. The least, most least likely person to make a change. Everybody else sees him or her as too cold, too indifferent, too addicted, too distant, too old, too late. Everyone else gives no hope to this Saul. But for some reason, you do. You have this, can we call it a vision? You have this vision for this person. And God keeps bringing this person into your life, into your world, crossing your trail. He keeps making you think about this person. Maybe you argue like Ananias did couldn't be true. Many people have told me about the harm that this man has done to the church. He argued with God. But the vision just wouldn't go away. Saul, my chosen vessel. And maybe God has given you a vision for somebody. Moms tend to have these visions. Moms don't give up on their kids. Beneath this very roof, not long ago, a mom talked to me about her son who's serving time in a maximum security prison for robbery. But she was insistent. I mean, she almost had a finger in my face. He's a good boy, she said. He made a bad decision, but he's a good boy. And when he gets out, he's going to be okay. A vision. A vision. I was at a store this last week. 
a bookstore, and I ran into a man, a friend of mine, who just celebrated 50 years of marriage. And he was telling me about his marriage, and he teared up as he described the saint that he married and the jerk that his wife married. He said, when we married, I didn't believe in God. I mistreated people, and I was harsh. He said, one day I came home six weeks into the marriage, and there she was, sitting in the bathtub, crying, wondering if she had made a mistake by marrying me. But she didn't give up on me. She stayed with me. She believed in me. A vision. A vision. Visions can be those images that we see in the sky or images that we see in our dreams. But visions can also be something that we feel in our heart. Something that we see in somebody. A potential that we see that's unrealized. A capability that's undiscovered. A future that maybe even they don't see. And maybe one of the great responsibilities and privileges of your life and mine is to believe in somebody that no one else believes in? You think God gives visions? Some of you have had a Ananias in your life, haven't you? You had somebody who didn't give up on you. Uh, maybe a grandmother, or a coach, or a friend, a spouse. God gives visions. He gave one to Ruth about Naomi. This Old Testament story, Naomi was a widow, broke. Ruth saw something in her, though. And instead of abandoning her mother-in-law, Ruth said, wherever you go, I will go. She had a vision for Naomi and stuck with her. God gave a vision to an Old Testament prophet by the name of Samuel. He gave Samuel a vision about David. Everyone else saw David as just a sheep herding runt of the family. But how did Samuel see David? As the king of Israel. In turn, David had a vision about somebody, and curiously, he had a vision about Saul. Not the Saul we're studying, but the king Saul of his day, who was also a tyrant, who was trying to kill David. But David didn't give up on Saul. And when he could have killed Saul, he didn't. He spared him, and he called him the Lord's anointed. That's a vision. That when everybody else sees Saul, the killer, you see a person of potential. Of course, nobody had more vision for people than Jesus himself. He saw something in Peter that was worth developing. He saw something in the adulterous woman that was worth forgiving. He saw something in John that was worth harnessing. Even on the cross, he saw something in the thief on the cross that was worth saving. And when he saw this wild-eyed, extremist, terrorist named Saul... He saw something that he could turn into Paul, the apostle of grace. So I guess the question of the message would be this. Has God given you a soul? Is he using you to believe in somebody? You see, God believes in people through people. He loves people through people. And one of your assignments and one of mine might be to simply be an, an Ananias in somebody's life. Well, what does an Ananias do? Well, we know what this Ananias did. He called Saul brother. He told him that Jesus had sent him. And he said, I have come that you can receive your sight and receive the Holy Spirit. Well, we can do that. We can stay in touch with somebody. And we can call them brother. We can treat them like family. We can love them. We can accept them when everyone else rejects them. And we can remind them that Jesus is coming after them, looking for them, that Jesus is still in the picture, and that we're praying that they receive the Holy Spirit and that they receive their sight. 
Sometimes all we need is to know that somebody still believes in us. And who knows, by the time we have a conversation with our Saul, we may find what Ananias found, and that is Jesus has already done the work. Jesus has already done the dramatic deed, and we're just here to, I don't know, wipe a few scales off the face. I wonder if you'd allow me to close by telling you my favorite Ananias-like story. It involves a couple of uh, college roommates. The Ananias of the pair was a real tolerant soul. He tolerated his roommate's late-night drunkenness, midnight throw-ups, and all-day sleep-ins. He didn't complain when his roommate disappeared for the weekend or smoked cigarettes in the car or left chewing tobacco stuff on the desk. He could have requested a new roommate. He, he could have requested one who went to church more or cursed less or cared less about impressing girls. But he hung in there this Ananias did with his personal Saul. He seemed to think that something good would happen if this guy could just pull his life together. So he kept cleaning up his mess and covering his back and inviting him to church. And though I don't remember a light, and I've certainly never been on the back of a horse on the way to Damascus, I can tell you the date and take you to the place where Jesus finally knocked me off my high horse and left me looking inside and I didn't like what I saw. And my life has never been the same since that day. It took four semesters. But God finally broke through and he used a roommate to do it. Maybe through all these years I've said something to you that's been encouraging or lifted your spirits. I hope so. If so, you might want to thank my Ananias, who is also one of your elders, Steve Green. And you might want to heed those visions that God gives you about an Ananias and Saul potential relationship. And you might want to look on your map for a street called Straight.